Good evening. I'd like to call this meeting of the Anacorta City Council to order. And um, Mr. Franciot, would you take the roll, please? Mr. Carter. Present. M Mr. Young. Here. Mr. Walters. Here. Ms. Cleland McGrath. Ms. Moulton. Here. Mr. McDougal. Ms. Hubick. Here. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Young. Yes. Uh, Mr. Walters. McDougal sends word that he's getting off a plane and he'll be half an hour, 45 minutes late, but he is intending to attend. Thank you. Mr. Young. Yes. I move to excuse Ms. Cleland McGrath from the meeting tonight. She has um, a sick child tonight, so. Thank you. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, next, we'll do the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, thank you. Um, as you can tell, I'm not Mayor Miller, and uh, <laughs> I, um, I'm Anthony Young, I'm city councilman, but I'm also Mayor Pro Tem. And Mayor Miller is away attending the National League of Cities Congressional City Conference, and so I'm stepping in in his um, being away. I'm going to start out with announcements and committee reports. I will begin with one from uh, the Trestle reopening celebration to remind everybody that it will be held March 31st at 2 p.m. that the Samish Indian Nation has generously um, hosting the event at Fidalgo Bay Resort, which is at 4701 Fidalgo Bay Road. The event will run from 2 p.m to 4 p.m. on Friday, March 31st. Mayor Miller will kick off the event thanking our construction partners, Transpac Marina, Carberson Marine, Strandberg Construction. He will also thank the Anacortes Parks Foundation for their leadership in gathering donations such that the community partners as the Anacortes Kiwanis Club, Kiwanis Club, the Samish Indian Nation, Marathon Petroleum, HF Sinclair Refinery, Skagit County Board of Commissioners, and Anacortes Rotary, and the Miller Group Charitable Trust. And so if you can, uh, I think it'll be a wonderful event, and so hopefully you'll be able to show up there. Um, next, and short of any other announcement, um, we're going to see, is there a fiber committee report? There is. Mr. Young. The fiber committee met last week, uh, consisting of myself and Mr. McDougall. Um, we got some updates on our progress in the EDA area, which is the area that is funded by the Economic Development Administration grant, the federal grant uh, that has quite a few strings attached to it. Staff is working through those strings and making progress. Notably, they submitted the site certificate, which is an important step because it certifies that we have the right to, to put the fiber in the ground or on the um, poles in the area that we're talking about. Our project officer turns around review of our invitation to bid in two weeks. So once that's ready, we expect to get that back pretty quickly. Uh, and we expect the EDA area to continue moving forward more or less on the schedule that it is now. now that isn't the next part of the project. The, the, the current uh, part of the project is the Guimas View area. That's uh, going well. Um, <clears throat> we are able to, with our own internal staff, put the fiber into the conduit that is being laid by our contractor. Uh, so we're, we're happy with that. It, it's costing us money in overtime, but it also means that we're not going out for another contractor, which we have found difficult to achieve. Um, uh, RBC is also continuing their restoration work in the earlier area, the West End area, um, and they 
are now doing better uh, to the extent Public Works is now happy with what they're uh, doing on the ground. They're using a, a new technique. Um, uh, it's described to us as being called infrared, but doesn't actually use infrared light to soften the asphalt and, and replace it. <clears throat> uh, previously, they were creating more loose stones as a result of evaporating the binder in the, in the asphalt, and that problem apparently is, is solved. Um, so we're getting a much better product in the restoration work where they're covering trenches and those kinds of things in the west end, the area that's now already in service. Uh, we are almost done acquiring our next and I think last uh, 1,000 uh, IPv4 addresses, the addresses that are required to operate the network. And we are actually getting a better price um, than we previously anticipated for those. Um, Fiber staff is now working on putting their replacement equipment into the uh, Department of Information Services equipment repair program, so not the regular Public Works er &R program, but the IS department's program. Um, and we did identify as a committee that it would be very useful if we had visibility into both er and r and the DIS uh, replacement schedule um, and make sure that we're funding that appropriately as we go on. Um, as I mentioned, the Guimas View component the, the current construction project is about 40 or 40% 40 or so complete for the, the trenching, the conduit, and the pavement. So, you know, following that is, is the uh, fiber, but they are really able to keep up with that. So we seem to be about maybe 40% overall complete with laying that distribution network uh, in the Guimas View area. Um, a couple of other components here of the, of the project. We, um, staff are pursuing a, a variety of little contracts that are below the mayor's contract authority, so they won't come to council. But for example, there's, um, they're outsourcing um, compliance with the Communications Assistance to Law Enforcement Act, which is sort of the Federal Wire Tapping Act for uh, information services. Um, it's going to cost us $275 a month, much cheaper than us trying to do it in-house. Uh, we're also looking at, at other changes to um, for things that we can outsource that are relatively inexpensive. The final big policy question uh, is going to be a line of, uh, how we are going to pay off our line of credit that we have that funded the West End and the uh, Guimas View. Um, repayment is due January 1, 2024. And so we talked about maybe now is the time with us ha to the point finally where we have a pretty good number, pretty good handle on how much it's going to cost to complete Guimas View and then pretty soon how much it will cost to complete the EDA area uh, to do the math and figure out how much we can accommodate internally in interfund loans so that we can pay that off immediately uh, when it's due. Um, but then we also need to determine what the fiber and the fiber department, uh, if there is one, looks like post build out. Um, cash flow is still looking good and trending good. So otherwise, we think we're doing all right there. And then if you will permit me, uh, today, I also attended my first meeting of the Housing Task Force, which is a component of the county's North Star project. And uh, we talked about a number of things. The Housing Task Force, I think, has been going along here for a while, but they have recently added me as a member. Um, I relayed my vision for Skagit County to remain, at least the unincorporated area, um, a landscape characterized by natural resource industry, our agricultural lands, our forest lands, and for our cities to continue to develop without really substantial expansion. Um, of course, Anacortes is also constrained by uh, Anacortes community forest lands and solid bedrock, uh, where it becomes very difficult to expand uh, the city limits. But also Mount Vernon and Burlington are surrounded by protected ag land and floodplain. So everybody's got quite a few constraints that they need to focus on. The big thing that's coming down the pike for us is um, consequences of uh, new state legislation passed in the last legislative session that will say we need to accommodate not just the population figures that we've always had to accommodate um, that are generated by the State uh, Department of Office of Financial Management, but also their breakdown of how much housing at each income level uh, the counties need to be able to support because it's not, simply not sufficient to build high-end housing for everybody. Uh, we need to be able to accommodate um, and, and actually see built on the ground housing for hospital workers, housing for restaurant folks, 
housing for all the segments of our community, and there's a statewide realization of that with this new legislation, those numbers come down to the county level, and then they are um, more or less by consensus through the countywide planning policies distributed to the cities and towns. Uh, and so the North Star project is not gonna duplicate that process. That process is already established, and it will, it will simply build on that. But North Star is probably going to seek to articulate the rationale for that, the reason, um, and try to get all of our elected officials on the same page with respect to building out housing for all segments of our community in every community. Um, we also talked quite a bit about the prospect of having some kind of enforcement mechanism. So for instance, in Anacortes, we have been trying pretty hard on housing. You know, we have a housing committee that meets every week. We have a whole new development code. Um, other communities are making more progress than us. Other communities are making less. It cannot be that some communities carry the entire burden for the whole state. It needs to be that everybody does their share. There is no currently no enforcement mechanism for that. So what does that look like? So we started that discussion. We are going to be meeting every other week um, and eventually plan to generate a work plan and then implement that work plan that'll look at everybody's development codes, not just Anacortes's, but every city's. What are the barriers to development? What are the barriers for development of housing at the more affordable lower income levels? And how we can actually make progress, not just through the land use code, but also with subsidies and also with other programs. Um, so it's sort of an exciting uh, task force. We'll see how, um, how well it does and whether it bears fruit, but uh, I'll keep you all informed as things move forward. Thank you, Mr. Walter. Sounds like lots of work is getting done and lots of thought coming to the table. Uh, next, I think we have uh, the planning committee report. Mr. Young. Ms. Moulton. Thank you. The planning committee met just prior to this meeting. It was Mr. Walters and I and staff was planner Libby Grage, planner um, Grace Pollard, and soon to be exiting planning director Don Miesmer. We spoke first of the West Basin pre-application submitted by the Port of Anacortes and what that will look like on 9th Street. There is proposed to be a very small property swap in order to improve that intersection, which has been so problematic over the years, with a pretty significant public park to be developed at the end of 9th Street, which would maintain that view corridor and also provide a really nice public amenity. Um, that part of that conversation includes the heavy haul route that is used a couple of times a year and how best to site that and also including a 10th Street view corridor to keep that open. So the port's working with us on that, which is great. Our second topic was MJB, which is always of great interest. And they are, the city is, is, is asking for a framework development plan, which will show us what is really intended to be done with that site along with the preliminary plat approval so that the public, the council, the whole community can know what that is proposed to look like ultimately and have an opportunity to comment on it and have input. So the things that the framework development plan include are block frontages, view corridors, heights, open space, public access elements, and the connection to the waterfront via um, 22nd Street, among other places, and what that esplanade will look like. So we really want to see that soon so that we have an opportunity to help potentially guide how that moves forward. So that was good, good news, good to hear about. There has been some information that Mr. Walters referenced, the Office of Financial Management has population projections for the county. So that the Skagit Council of Governments hired a consultant, and so they'll be breaking those down. So that's just preliminary, but we'll, we'll be hearing more on that soon, as Mr. Walter said. There is a parking code rewrite in progress. Um, so that will be coming forward. And then we also talked about Commercial Avenue, about improving pedestrianization on that, route, on that road and what we can do um, with some work with the Downtown Association to slow traffic on Commercial 
make it even nicer than it already is. And there was some talk about parklets too, so that, that conversation is ongoing. And um, I thank people for their input on that. And that's it. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Moulton. Um, next, I think the library committee did not meet. And I think that um, uh, there was a report, I think, sent over um, by Mr. Lunsford. So, OK, we'll go next to the Housing Affordability and Community Service Committee report. Mr. Young. Yes, Mr. Uh, the Housing Affordability and Community Services Committee, affectionately known as the HACS Committee, uh, met last Thursday, uh, Ms. Moulton, Ms. Colleen McGrath, and myself. And we talked about um, articulating a, a strategy, an approach, and a policy for T Avenue. Um, I think there is a generally a, a recognition that our ground game isn't working down there and we need to put the ball in the air. We need to be able to articulate what that policy is to the public, but also to the people that are currently living on T Avenue. Uh, and then we need to be able to put substantial resources behind that policy and enforce it. So we have been doing some drafts of some writing associated with that so that we can all have um, uh, the same idea of where we are and what the conditions are on the ground. And then we can discuss it in some cohesive way and then adopt it and do something and move forward. So um, we haven't set a date for such a meeting. We are going to be meeting, we have met with the Family Center and we are going to be meeting with Helping Hands. Um, uh, you know, we want to get their input, uh, but we also understand that this needs to be a city-led process. It's our city that we're protecting and uh, our citizens that we are assisting. So um, soon, I expect. You know, we can have a full council dis uh, discussion about that and how to move forward. Thank you, Mr. Walters. I would like to add to that that um, the city and, of course, council has received a number of um, emails and letters um, voicing their opinion on the subject, and all of that is a part of the record. And um, so we're going to be moving forward, as Mr. Walters said, and we'll figure out what we're going to bring to council, and then the public will have a chance to weigh in and give their opinion even further than that. Thank you. Um, next, uh, it's the public comment. And I've got a uh, list of names here for, that want to come up and um, have their say. At the top of the list is Mr. Brian Welcher. And if you still want to speak, please come up. So you want to wait? OK, thank you. Um, I think the name is Zach Wright, right? Okay. Hello, uh, if you would. OK, thank you, Mr. Franciat. Hello, my name is Zach White. I live in Anacortes. Uh, full address, uh, 5013 Kingsway. Mr. Mr. Wright, if you would speak a little bit closer to the microphone just yes. to make sure everybody can hear whatever it is you're going to tell us, okay? Yes. Thank you. Um, Zach White, 5013 Kingsway. I'm here representing Procession of the Species Anacortes, which all the council members uh, and others have uh, seats have this brochure. Uh, and uh, so Procession of the Species Anacortes is a procession that started in Olympia. It uh, brings together art, music, dance, and um, you know, creates a uh, community event that uh, where you create masks and costumes and it celebrates the natural world and uses that uh, art and that community connection to make that connection with the natural world, as well as between each other. So uh, the procession is happening June 10th, and uh, we're planning workshops in May. 
Um, we invite everyone to participate in the city, you know, as well as the surrounding larger Anacortes community. Um, this is Andy. Hi, a Andy Stewart, 3508 West 8th Place, and um, I'm part of the group that's helping bring the procession here. Um, it's been going on 25 years, almost 30 years in Olympia. It's really a celebration, um, and uh, thank you, uh, council members, for considering um, the open streets uh, proposal in the Senate agenda. Um, we have a lot of public support, uh, a lot of partners in the community. There should be music, uh, people from the schools, from uh, you know maybe scout troops. Uh, people can bring, make their own stuff at home, or they can join us for um, any of our workshops that we're going to do um, out, out back at Johnny Picasso's in the month of May. So anybody who would is interested can find us. Um, it's uh, at, could you say that? At POTS Anacortes, P-O-T-S Anacortes on Facebook and Instagram, as well as uh, P-O-T-S Anacortes at, uh, dot org, the website. And we'll be looking for um, volunteers and supplies um, too. So if anybody's interested in helping organize or wants more information, um, let us know. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next on the list, I have Andy Stewart. That's you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Beth Bell. Beth Bell, uh, Old Town, Anacortes. I was hoping for a few more people to be here tonight, so this is a little harsh because I finally got the gumption to write. Um, this is regarding the homeless, the RVs, and the drugs. Houston, we have a problem, or rather Anacortes. Seattle, Washington State, and for that matter, the entire country. The condition of homelessness isn't just because of a lack of affordable housing. The homelessness that is plaguing our town state and country is mostly due to the lack of means and facilities for mental health, which then double and triple into drug addiction. The ball is rolling downhill and has gained such momentum that the normal rules of governing have become skewed to protect the population, but not actually help them. Anacortes is probably the strongest and most successful community in our state because of the commitment by the Anacortes Family Center, its platform, its supporters, and the city of Anacortes. They help and are persistent in trying to give help to those that want, and sometimes those that don't really realize that they need or want help. So how does the city and state take care of the population that doesn't want our help, that continue to break laws, create unsafe environments in our parks, trails, and residential areas? It isn't by creating laws to protect them like Blake, it isn't by creating ordinances that result in arrest. Arresting him into a system that is understaffed, overwhelmed, and doesn't have the time and or resources to deal with petty crimes, overdoses, and detox facilities is not the answer. Allowing them rights and privileges is tricky. Yes, they are citizens of the US. They choose not to live by our laws. How and why do we continue to reward that behavior? Choice. Yes, we have the choice to continue the same path or we have the choice to change that path and trajectory. I think most of us would agree we are not trying to rid our streets of the homeless that are down on their luck. We have agencies and nonprofits that are helping them because they need and want help. And we are a community that has compassion and resources to help those that want and need it. And I, for that, support that. What we need to address are the drugs and mental health issues. The state, in its infinite wisdom, closed down the one and only mental health institution. Why? I'll never understand. It forced these individuals onto our streets. Then, in their hopelessness and wanting to numb themselves, they turn to drugs and become addicted. You can't reason with those who are hooked on drugs. They have lost the capacity to comprehend, deal, and live in the real world. So, why do we keep trying? 
Our state and federal government must take the hard and drastic measures to address mental health. If not, the problem will continue to grow and become untenable. We are certainly close to reaching that sad day. If we continue to turn a blind eye to mental health issues, we will continue to have violent and potentially deadly outcomes that affect our children in schools, the innocent public, and of course the addicted and mentally ill population themselves. Yes, it is a vicious cycle, but just stating the obvious doesn't fix the obvious. I implore this city, county, and state to do the hard work. Creating affordable housing isn't the issue with this population. Creating laws and facilities that get them help or get them off the streets is what is needed. And yes, it can be completed in a successful and humane manner. Do the hard work. Stop self-pontificating. The number of times I've heard a council person, hired civil servant, state or federal legislator say, I started, I created, I wrote, is sickening to hear and is self-serving. When are you going to act as a team and become we? In my humble opinion, this would be a good place to start. Please work together on the local and state levels to help the population that has been abandoned and is in danger to our law and is a danger to our law-abiding community. Everyone has said this isn't an easy task. It is multidimensional, and then act as if it is beyond your capabilities. Start working together. Please look outside the box for solutions. Use creativity, positivity. Look at platforms that have proven track records. Imitate and enhance them. The Anacortes Family Center is a good place to start. Don't get stuck in your boxes, which is where I believe everybody is stuck right now. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bell. <clears throat> Next, we have Ms. Bashi Morris. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity here. Bashi Morris, 1618 7th Street. I live very close to the Kiwanis uh, Guimas Channel Park. And my concern is who will address the fact that this park is rapidly being overtaken by invasive species. Fifteen or so years ago when this park was built, uh, a species of Willow was designated as a brilliant idea. However, I've worked a lot on the upper Skagit River and all it takes to generate a willow tree is to stick a stick in the ground. You do not need roots. These are taking over, they're over height, they seed readily, and they're blocking the views for which this park was built. I don't know who to address this to, and that is aside from the blackberry issue, that is also uh, removing the view from even up on uh, 6th Street when there's a couple of park benches. So if someone could tell me, who do I take this to and how do we get some movement on addressing specifically planted invasive species? Who do I talk to? Normally, Ms. Morris, we don't necessarily respond with an answer to that question because this is your chance to speak. But one of the okay. things that did come to mind is that we could begin with um, probably Mr. Lunsford and would be a, a good source of beginning for that because he maintains the parks and just, um, you know, Dave and the arborists that we already have. So we have in-house people that can begin to help the city figure out how we need to address it. Okay. And I think you bring up a unique issue that everybody is having, but mm -hmm. it is an issue that needs to be addressed. I can acknowledge that. But I do okay. think that that's where we will begin. And I think as a matter of this meeting, what we will do is reach out to John, and I would also suggest you do as well, and okay. just keep us informed. I appreciate you coming forward. Thank you. And that would be through the Department of Parks and Recreation then? That's correct. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, next, I have Mr. John Hilburn, if I'm saying that correct. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, resident of 48 North up by the ferry landing off of Oaks. Uh, I see this is not a question and answer period and I may be guilty of not doing my homework here. Maybe there is an answer to this that I have not looked for properly. Uh, I'm going to address first uh, the levy lift. Um, seems like all the publicity, what there has been in the publications that we have gotten in the mail were uh, focused on uh, the need for staffing increases for police and fire, which I wouldn't even argue with. Uh, what I'd concerns me is, once again, uh, the levy lift, if this is a one-time thing or if this can be uh, once again instituted uh, at the will of the council to lift levies or if it has to be addressed to the taxpayers every time. Um, as a retiree, you know, my assessments have gone up. Uh, I continue to give up ground in uh, the remaining uh, quality of my finances to address other things uh, besides paying taxes. <laughs> Um, so, I don't know, that's my comment, and it's probably more a question than a comment, but I, I see this is not the proper venue for that. Uh, the other issue I had on my mind, uh, you addressed that government at a higher level has taken uh, the issue of our population density, how, what our housing has to be. Uh, away from us and told us what it's going to be so that we're going to have to comply with another government dictate from a higher level and it uh, I can't help but wonder if the infrastructure has got a chance to be in place before all of this happens because I don't really see much happening in the way of infrastructure to facilitate both traffic flow and even, as I recall last summer, questions from, uh, or urgence from some source to conserve water. So I wonder if we've got the water resource to handle all this increasing density that I see happening all over the place. Um, I won't even talk the conditions of the road. The road conditions, as I view it, are not real great in the city. So, you know, the whole concept of making us a metro area and extending Seattle up here is not my friend. I didn't come to this town looking for that. I came looking for the small town atmosphere, and I, I found it here. But it seems like the council and the city government and the state government and at every level is bent on taking that apart and metropolitanizing us. I tried to get away from that. And uh, I guess I'll never be successful. I appreciate. Thank you, Mr. Hilburn. Um, to that point, I will say and suggest to anyone, as Mr. Hilburn did here tonight, there are forthcoming discussions here at council as we move forward on how we might proceed, what we might do as a city, what we want to look like as a city. I encourage you to come out and voice your opinion at that point also and uh, let us know. It does shape sometimes the things that we are able to do as a city because again, we're public servants here to serve you and we're here to serve the best interests of our city to make sure that it progressively moves forward. Mr. Walters. Uh, thank you, Mr. Young. I was just going to say that, yes, a levy lid lift has to go to the voters every time. Um, th that's why it's going to the voters now, and um, <clears throat> the city is otherwise uh, very constrained in its ability to change the tax rate. Um, the other part of your question is much more complicated, but feel free to make an appointment, and we can, we can talk through some of those issues. Thank you, Mr. Walters. Any comment? Okay, thank you. not seeing any hands up online. I see we have participants. Anybody else in the audience uh, wanted to? Uh, yes, sir. Come up and y you know the drill by now, I'm sure.
Good evening, uh, City Council, or part of it anyway. It's good to see you folks. First, I'd like to make a comment about uh, Mr. Walters and his comments on. Excuse uh, me, Mr. Pearl, would you um, announce who you are? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, Thank I forgot you. it again. Mike Pearl, Anna Quarters, 1617 O Avenue. Um, Mr. Walters made some pretty good comments last week about uh, uh, the zoning and R4. Uh, a lot of issues that I thought were pretty, uh, had, had come with a lot of thought, and I thought that the uh, city council really didn't pay much attention to him. I, I uh, um, give it much value, and I think that's a shame. The city's got a lot to do with this zoning issue. <clears throat> my, my other comments are, uh, <clears throat> I moved to Anacortes 38 years ago to have a small town in which to raise my two school-aged children. We looked for over a year at affordable houses to call home and finally settled on 20th Street, two blocks up from Commercial. It was a well-established middle-class na residential neighborhood that seemed to suit our family's needs and economic lifestyle. At the time, I was working for Skagit Self-Help Housing was a construction supervisor or co-supervisor of three groups in the area on West 4th and 5th, just uh, south of the Loverick Boat Works up on the hill there. They were affordable single-family homes. Uh, just as an aside, when those houses were finished, the, uh, the occupants, they all moved in at the same time. They all worked on each other's houses. Uh, they had thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 in equity in the houses when they moved in. It's a great facility, a great mechanism for getting affordable housing in a community like this. Uh, we loved this area <clears throat> because it had a scale of family housing, one and two story homes that people had been living in for decades. Decades. Houses were distinct, different, charming, in various styles and shapes and utility, but they were personal. There was a real human scale to that area. Most of it's still there. We didn't move to that <clears throat> location to live with a group of towering, cold, faceless boxes with very little personal charm and warmth. And now it will get worse. The first is here. It all go flats, five story, in the middle of uh, that part of town. The second one may start any day now and the result and end, and it will come, could likely be scattered mishmash of high rise monoliths among the one and two story residential homes. The next one that it seems to be is coming up is right across the street from the existing one. They could spring up all over that R4 area. Here's one, there's one, two together. I now live in a neighborhood, a block off commercial, <clears throat> Uh, that's a block away from the Fidago Flats building. And as I drive into town, <clears throat> it gives me, and I'm certain many others, the welcoming sense of a personal well-being and safety and home, and has done so for many, many decades. Drive down commercial, there's a scale of the housing, of the construction, there's new ones coming in all the time. And I'm wondering, is there no value to that? Are we just going to have a row of five-story buildings that... Uh, for housing. Um, I think there's a, the sense of well-being when you come into town has an emotional as well as an economic value, and that should be important. The neighborhoods along the two or three blocks on either side of commercial get a, give a sense of coming home, of people with families of small and small businesses that help a community thrive and be a good, good place to live and visit. You and your decisions are opening the doors to a canyon-like, cold, and sterile, dystopian future of this charming town. Your decisions are giving all value to the future and no value to the people who have been here who have made this town what it is. And by the way, anybody on the council live in the R4 zone? Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Pro. Short of that, I think, uh, short of that, I don't see any uh, one online with their hands up at this point. And so, uh, next we're going to move on to the consent agenda. Council? Mr. Young. Yes. I move to approve the consent agenda, items A through D. 
second. So we have a, um, uh, a, a motion and a second. Uh, and uh, Mr. Francois, would you take the roll? Uh, Mr. Young, normally we do that by voice vote for the consent agenda, but I'm happy to do that. If you'd All like. right, thank Would you. Would you like me to do the voice vote? Yes, please. Okay. Mr. Young. Yes. Mr. Walters. Yes. Ms. Moulton. Yes. Ms. Hubick. Yes. Mr. Carter. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Francia. Uh, next is other business. Item 6A is the contract award program update uh, Anacortes Family Center Social Worker Agreement number 23-113-APD-001. And this is an action item. And I think we got the chief coming up. Good evening, Mayor Pro Tem and members of the council, members of the audience. Tonight I'm asking for a renewal of the agreement between the city and the Anacortes Family Center. I have Anacortes Family Center Executive Director, Mr. Johnson here tonight to give you uh, a quick update. Uh, some of you may recall seeing uh, some of Mr. Johnson's update emailed out recently. And then I can uh, explain the, the uh, request for renewal and answer any questions. Thank you, Chief. Mr. Johnson? Good evening, Council, Mayor Pro Tem uh, community. So I issued a, a quarterly report for our outreach efforts, and uh, I won't go through every line item, but I'll just touch on kind of the key pieces. So um, as of our March 15th report date, we had uh, 25 outed, um, outreach activities that uh, in, uh, led to meeting 151 clients. 53 of those clients were uh, distinctly served. So the success, we had five clients that graduated out of T Avenue, finding housing elsewhere. Um, and specifically two most recently that secured uh, really great housing that is permanent with a lease for at least a year. Uh, the demographics of T are exactly what they've been over the last um, span of time. So uh, a lot of adults, one family with children, but by and large, these are single adults uh, that seem to be the most uh, resistant to services in our community. To combat that, we are doing everything within our power to provide resources to them uh, to try to catch that, that sometimes fleeting moment of change where someone goes from pre-contemplative to contemplative uh, in their willingness to get help for drugs or mental illness. Um, and that's really what our aim is. We have a counselor that goes out, works on site, has a deep rapport with these individuals um, and is actively working a plan to try to get them to see the good that could come from them engaging in this. And then also a substance use to, a professional disorder that can dispatch and do assessments or screenings or, or find a bed for clients when they're ready to pass the contemplation point into action. We've provided 18 clients um, with services, getting them into the HMIS waiting pool uh, four client um, resumes were prepared, 39 housing applications were prepared on behalf of the client, 10 job applications were prepared, um, and then we pl uh, plugged one client into the COPES program. We provided um, a fairly nominal number of uh, supplies. That, those were um, three gift cards, 18 bus passes, one gas card, one clothing voucher, and four laundry vouchers. The reason for this is not because we want to be stingy with these, the resources like gift certificates or something of, of monetary value. The reason that we are somewhat conservative in how we give it out is that our message is that as long as your household is meeting the 
uh, city's ordinances that you have less than a cubic yard of waste outside, that you're not dumping black water into our storm, storm water drains, you're not stealing electricity from your neighbors, you're not actively and openly doing drugs um, that are impacting your neighbors. If you're not doing those things, we will really do everything within our power to get you into a better living situation. Um, however, if you don't avail yourselves uh, of, those, of those opportunities, then you simply don't get the reward. And what's been difficult is that it's, we've been working in an, in an environment where we have these expectations and attempt to put these expectations and boundaries into place, um, and our other service partners aren't. Um, and so there's really a disincentive to work with our team versus another team where those things, uh, those, those same uh, pieces of accountability just simply don't exist. Uh, it sounds like we're working to try to rectify that problem. We have been working to rectify that problem for some time, and I'm hopeful that we can come to a good conclusion on it. But a lot of great work has been done. Mr. Ms. Young. Ms. Moulton. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Just a quick, um, just to fill in a little bit of a blank on acronyms, um, 18 clients have been entered in HMIS. That's the Homeless Management Information System. So this is a program that we are required to use from State Commerce that essentially is the program that all national service providers use, and it tracks uh, where a client goes and when they access services and what services they access, regardless of where they're at in a geographic area. So it covers the entire US. So if a client leaves Anacortes, um, exits our shelter, and, and we report that it's a successful outcome, and then they go a year and a half later, and they get in a domestic violence relationship and are kicked out and put into another um, domestic violence shelter, that will pick up on our report uh, as a hit against our recidivism rate. So our recidivism rate measures anybody that re-enters the system after 12 months. Um, and so it, it really gives you a pretty good qualitative and quantitative data, data analysis of what's going on in your program. So if someone from Phoenix, mm -hmm. say, was in the HMIS system and then came to Anacortes and became involved with yeah. AFC in some way, would that would you be able to see yes. that they were an HMIS entry already? Yes. And the, by and large, yes. The only exception being if they've gone out of their way to get into like a witness protection program or um, have legal documentation that obscures their, their ability to um, create easily, identifi uh, easily identifiable information in their record. Okay, thank you. And then you say one COPE program application prepared. Could you tell us what that is? Yeah, so the COPE's program uh, um, is, and Beatrice, my program director, would be able to tell you more, um, but it is a resource intensive program for families around kids. Um, so it's, it's a school and behavioral ed uh, program that, that supports kids in that, that space. Great, thank you. And I think an important point that you touched on is the accountability part, because obviously there's a perception that things are just being given away with no expectation and that the city is encouraging people to stay and you know I can see where that comes from but I think that some of the merit of this program and our outreach team is results are tied to accountability that's why you're not just giving out gift cards willy-nilly that there are expectations attached and how important it is that all service providers and even well-meaning generous community members are in concert and in tandem on this because it takes all of us and if an organization is is doing something contrary to that it, it weakens the efforts of the whole thing and we know that coordination is hard communication is difficult among agencies and even individuals sometimes so we are all working together on that but it's it's not always easy so so thanks for calling that out 
Yeah, absolutely. And, and that is a personal trigger of mine. I mean, I came, grew up in the field of nonprofits out of um, the recession when we were seeing a lot of organizations fold and a lot of resources going away. And so for me, it is um, antithetical f that we would have in such a resource limited environment, so many uh, duplicative services that are laid on top of each other that aren't coordinating without any good reason for the lack of coordination. And believe me when I tell you, it is as frustrating for the provider as it is for the client we're trying to serve. Uh, they, don't, they, they don't need an additional barrier to try to figure out the difference between, you know, a Judy and a, a Karen, right? It's, that's just noise. Um, and so I find that it is both um, pro, it really is problematic for the city writ large because I think things are then getting out to make it seem like we are much more accommodating than we are really trying to set the bar to be. Um, and conversely, um, it's frustrating for the residents because uh, there's no predictability in how things are being asked for and there's no like clear guideline on what they're supposed to be following. Um, and different agencies are diff saying different things. Uh, so it, it is confusing for everyone and I think harming um, the cause that we're all trying so hard to get at. Uh, Mr. Johnson, if I might follow up a little bit on what Ms. Uh, Moulton uh, indicated. Thank you, first of all, for the reports that you send out to mm -hmm. council. It's so important that you know we are aware of what's taking place with so many issues, so many wonderful causes um, that the city attempts to address as best as we can. And as council members being public servant, uh, servants, our role is to um, be as abreast as we possibly can, but also try to help facilitate those solutions that are coming forward. You know, I think in our world with so many issues up, it almost sometimes can seem overwhelming. Mm -hmm. uh, the thoughts, the ideas, the solutions, and there's just no guaranteed roadmap to getting to where we are. So I appreciate um, the family center's determination to put forward this approach and move it and such that it demonstrates, I guess to the many, of what's expected. And uh, so I appreciate that. If you would, would you speak just a little bit to the thought of um, this role in uh, expansion. You know, the need that's out there, I think um, Ms. Bell was speaking to, as many of us are already aware of mental illness is a huge thing. Even more, um, I guess, focus has been placed on it post-COVID, you know, and really bringing it forward to how do we begin to address it? Because in many ways, the money has just simply not been there. And so to find ways to squeeze that, those few dollars, those limited resources you spoke about, and then to tether the resources that we do have one to another. Uh, do you see this thing as an increasing need? You know, personally, I think that mental health is a big part of what we're seeing. Not only is it drugs out there, I, I get that. And I know that when we, whether we choose to look at how we pay for it, we're paying for it by the police going out. We're paying for it by filling our jails. We're paying for it by all of the other costs, clean up, whatever it is. We're still paying for it, and it's coming out of the time allocations and the money we have. Do you see this as something meaning um, you know, that social work component or that, you know, when I'm saying social work, what I really mean by that is that's part of it. But the tethering together, the linking together of the services that we have such that, you know, we can better communicate and better utilize those services that we do have as we seek to expand those services that we need. Would you speak to a little bit on that, if you want Yeah, to so <clears throat> Council Member Johnson used to say when he was on the dais that uh, he would look at other cities that, that gave a percentage of their budget to human services um, and, and always called out that, that that is not true for us, and, it, and indeed it isn't. And while this council has done a really admirable job of reallocating some resources to programs like this program or 
uh, like the program, uh, the grant that was just approved for community action, um, there certainly are other things that could be done and measures that could be taken to, to infuse capital into what I see as a very uh, local issue. It is, homelessness is absolutely a national issue with national uh, needs that need to be addressed in order to combat it, but in our community, it has to start with addressing person number one and then person number two, and we know their names and we know their stories and we know what's going on with them. And, and so, because we have that level of detail, we can address their needs on a, on a really specific basis. However, that does take money. Our suggestion from the Family Center has always been to um, play as nicely as we possibly can with the county with respect to document recording fees. Document recording fees are the only instruments that we have that are statutorily required to go to addressing services like homeless, uh, social service, affordable housing, and, and response. Um, and we've been working for 10 years to get geographic rep representation into that process. We account for about 25% of the, the doc fees that are collected in our community. So we're talking about you know upwards of $300,000 a year. Um, and we have historically gotten less than 10% of that back year over year over year. And the allocations committee that, that makes those determinations, there's nobody that lives from in, in, in Anacortes or uh, work in Anacortes on that allocations committee. And so the inherent bias that we've all heard of Anacortes is so rich that it can just take care of itself. It doesn't need any of this money that it's put in back because they've got so much that they can give us this and then some to address their own needs. We all know that that is a huge misnomer and a, a miscalculation by every, every stretch of the imagination. So our recommendation now, because this is such an enduring um, and indelible task that just seems to be um, caught in Groundhog's Day is to finally start making the steps to show the county that uh, we are interested in recouping our document recording fees. And what that would allow us to do is take the excellent ideas coming out of hacks or coming out of public safety um, and still fund projects across the bridge, still fund the projects that have the biggest impact for our residents, but have a much more thoughtful and thorough process through which to decide who and how those are funded rather than this, this rather one-sided um, and incredibly uh, opaque decision-making process that the county's been using. Thank you, Mr. Did that Jones. answer your question? Yes, it did. Okay. Mr. Walters? Uh, thank you, Mr. Young. Well, you definitely did provide Mr. Johnson an opportunity to talk about his favorite subject, and we have begun work on uh, the mechanics that are necessary to be able to recapture those funds, whether we would then proceed with that as a secondary question. But the first step is we have to adopt, we have to draft and adopt a homeless housing plan. The, the county has a homeless housing plan. The county is, um, I think, envisioned under state law as being the generalized provider of homeless services and managing the problem of homelessness. Um, but there's also recognition in state law that a local jurisdiction, a city, can take its own time, write its own plan, and then recapture those monies. So that's um, something that could happen in the future. With respect to this document, um, <clears throat> this contract largely continues the contract that we started two years ago. Um, same amount of money, same scope of work. Um, it does, I think, harmonize the end date with the end of the fiscal year and the calendar year, uh, which is good. Um, the, the one thing I would say about it, though, which is in line with everything else, you know, it says we'll provide an annual stipend. And I, th I think some of the reason it says annual is because it's equal monthly payments based on the amount of the year. But um, I think the Family Center and everybody else should be prepared for this changing. I mean, the county is uh, telegraphing that they are going to change how they fund things. This contemplates a motel voucher program. Uh, how will that be funded in the future? How will the family center um, be expected to respond to these types of things if we articulate a winning strategy on T Avenue or elsewhere for homelessness? It may look like a different role for the family center. Also, in the last year, we have added 
also through the Family Center, uh, the um, community paramedic expansion through the AWC grant, which we have been, I think, very impressed with. On the other hand, that grant ends uh, halfway through this year, so how does that get funded? This is great. We need to figure out how to be successful and be efficient at the moment. We don't need to worry about being sufficient, efficient. We need to worry about being successful. So let's get this going, keep this moving. Um, but at some point in the future, once we have figured out how to achieve success, we are going to need to retool things again. So I just want to make sure that that expectation is set. Otherwise, I would uh, move approval of the contract as it presented. We have approval, move of approval from Mr. Walters. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Carter. Any further discussion? Mr. Franciot, would you? Take the roll. Mr. Walters. Yes. Mr. Young. Yes. Ms. Moulton. Yes. Ms. Hubick. Yes. Mr. Carter. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, next on the agenda, we have item number 6B, which is ordinance 4044, amending the qualifications for the utility discount program. It's a discussion and possible action. All right, thank you. Mr. Young, thank you, members of the council and members of the audience. Um, I'll go through a couple of slides real quickly that we've looked at the last couple of weeks just as a refresher. But what we're, what we're looking at here is uh, amending the existing utility billing discount program in two ways. One is changing the, um, the income guidelines from the federal poverty threshold from 150% of the federal poverty rate to 50% of the average median family income as uh, published by HUD. And as we've talked about, this would make it easier for one and two person, actually less than four person households to qualify for the program. And as we've talked about, uh, the majority of our applicants are one and two person households. Uh, our existing program is a 20% discount. We're looking at potentially a 30% discount. So those are the two changes, changing the income guidelines and changing the amount of the discount. The ordinance that we have for your consideration tonight uh, edits the section of code that outlines the program. It's uh, Anacortes Municipal Code, section 3.5. So there is one change I wanted to talk about that uh, I exchanged emails with Mr. Walters today, so I appreciate the, um, the time and attention to that to, to clarify this one section of the ordinance or this section of code. And what that is, is this section 3.5.030, subsection D. So the ordinance that's in your packet tonight says the program applies to a mixed use building only to the extent that the program applies to individual accounts within the building, mixed use building where a single utility account covers more than one use would qualify based on the proportion of floor space. So what it's saying there is we have a, a number of mixed use buildings in the city that have just one meter. Um, it, we have uh, like the, the Wilson, the old Wilson Hotel might be a good example. We have, uh, there's commercial space on the bottom and then there are um, residential units on the top or multifamily units in the upper floors, that building is served with one water meter and one uh, sewer account. So it has one water account, one sewer account. And what we were initially thinking is that we could do an amount of discount based on the percentage of floor space that would be made up by low income applicants. But we, what we have found is we don't have the ability to make those types of adjustments in the utility billing system. So what, what I would like to propose to replace this section 
would be with this verbiage here. So I'll just read through it real quick and then we'll discuss it. In a mixed-use building where the non-qualifying use is not metered or distinguishable from the qualifying residential use, the program applies to the entire utility bill if the amount of floor area attributed attributable to a qualifying residential use exceeds the amount of floor area for the non-qualifying use. So what I was trying to say there is if we have a preponderance of square footage of the building or a majority of square footage of the building that is being occupied by a qualifying tenant, a tenant that qualifies for the utility billing discount, then the entire account would be eligible for that utility billing discount. So in our example with the Wilson Hotel, if, uh, if it's, say it's exactly 50-50, um, the, upper, the upper units, there were housing units, uh, were all eligible for the utility, utility billing discount, and then the lower units were commercial units, then that entire account would be eligible for the discount. So 50% or higher of the floor space qualifying for the discount then would qualify the entire account for the discount. So we hopefully that hopefully this makes sense we can set up an account one account as being on the discount but we can't set up a portion of the account as being on the discount it's it's all or nothing mr gun um, um, yes <laughs> <laughs> thank you mr hoagland so this would be for existing buildings because presumably any new building made up of non-residential and residential would have separate meters or no no, no. Okay, so we could, yeah so it'd be we would put this in place and then that would be uh, the effective practice moving forward as well so we have um at, we we still have that process in place where a, a big building that has a, a number of different uses is still served by one meter generally okay and so these buildings would be low-income housing, housing that would qualify for the discount, right? So it would be housing authority, family center, or mm -hmm. when that wonderful person comes along and builds a five-story building with affordable units in it at 50%, that could happen there too? Or would the yeah, non-affordable, yeah. the market rate have their own? If uh, if 50% of that, that five-story building that you're describing, if 50% of the tenants applied and qualified for the utility billing discount, then that building would get that discount. So that would be a further incentive for, to develop that affordable, ho affordable housing, could potentially. Yeah, absolutely, in, in my way of thinking, absolutely. Okay, and then the other thing that I wanted to, thank you for that, the other thing I wanted to mention is this is a way that the city is investing in our households that are below 50% of area median income. This is a way for pe to keep people in their homes and from becoming homeless, which is very far more economical than trying to, than helping them when they, after they become homeless. So this is a, this is a, this is a significant investment if we approve this by the city into to, for our population that 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 needs it, so thank you. Thank you, Ms. Milton. Mr. Walters. Thank you, Mr. Young. Uh, yeah, I would say that this proposed language is is kind of a hack to accommodate the incapacity of our uh, utility billing software to right. to do what we really want, which would be to proportionally apply the discount. Maybe in the future. The utility billing software is not long for this world, right? That's quite true. Uh, maybe in the future we will have the ability to, to make it more closely track our policy goals, but in the meantime, you know, this, this will work, I guess. Um, the, the other big thing about this program, and I mean, it, it makes those two big changes that you articulated uh, in your slides. One is the amount of the discount from 20 to 30 percent, and then the qualifications. Uh, but it also creates all of this framework for how the discount is applied and uh, when it is applied and uh, penalties for misrepresentation of your income and what qualifies as um, proof of income and those kinds of things. So there's quite a bit of uh, work there in, in figuring out how the mechanics of the program function. Um, but so, I mean, we're dealing with this all the time, the question of 
uh, should property taxes go up. We have proposed that on the ballot for the, for the very reason that you know, we can't spend utility revenue on police or fire. Uh, we can only spend general revenue, um, property tax or sales tax or those kinds of things, and we're limited in the other ways that we can uh, fund that. We can't just do a sales tax, for example. Um, but what we can do is give people a break on their utility costs. And uh, for those qualifying households here, this will be a significant break. Um, and we've raised utility costs substantially in the last 10 years. Um, I mean, it used to be that your base water fee was $5 a month. Um, and that was way too low because we could never fund replacement of things like the 3 million gallon water tank on Whistle Lake Road that was falling in on itself. So it couldn't be five, but it is also much higher than it used to be. And so this can help mitigate those expenses for people, especially those people who really cannot afford it um, or who are really um, pushed to living towards the margins because of the expense of utilities. Um, so this has a substantial benefit for those people, and it automatically enrolls those that are uh, already enrolled through the um, Senior Disabled Property Tax Income Program through the, through the county uh, without them having to do additional paperwork here for the city. Because uh, we have a utility discount program now and only about 50 families uh, are enrolled in it. Um, so it helps streamline that, helps get people the help that they need. Uh, I'm hoping that we move it forward uh, tonight. Thank you, Mr. Walters. Um, any other comments before, well, I guess, Mr. Hoagland, I need to let you finish, and then I'll open it up after that. How about that? Would that work? Yeah, and I'm... Okay, good. Thank you. I, and I'm, I'm actually done here. So we, had, uh, we did have our, our read last week. Um, so I, I think I've presented all the information I have, unless uh, council or citizens have other questions. Um, any citizens have any questions? Yes. Come forward, please. Board McKenzie, Anacortes. Um, I practically like the entire idea with one exception. This hack for figuring out how to pay for single, single uh, metered buildings really sucks. I have, if I am an owner of a building, or if I'm an owner of a business downstairs, and half of the building has a 30% discount, and I get a free 30% discount, that doesn't make any sense at all. There's got to be a better way of solving that. Thank you. Thank you. Any others? Mr. Young. Uh, yes, Mr. Walters. And I really agree with that comment. Um, I would also move this forward now, but try to circle back and fix that um, because I, I would even delete subsection D if necessary uh, to move it forward or leave it as proposed one way or another. Um, but it isn't the right way to do it. It's just you know, what is the limitation of our software and is there another thing that we can do with the software to accomplish it? I don't know, um, but I would like to try to figure that out to try to get it closer to our policy goals. Thank you, Mr. Walters. I'm not sure of the protocol at this point. Do we, Mr. Hoglin, would you sort of brief me on that? I mean, do, what do we do at this point? Since that we have had public comment, the council has made its uh, opinions known, what are our next steps? Do we take it back and bring it back, or do we have an opportunity for action? Yeah, and I think that's up to uh, council at this point. So it's a uh, it's very valid comment. It's a weakness in our utility billing system. When we were putting this verbiage together, we were trying to err on the side of mm -hmm. making it easier. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, not, it's not perfect, certainly, and we'd be happy to take it back, continue discussion, kicking it around at the um, committee level, um, or if council wanted to, to move it forward tonight, it's, uh, it's really your call tonight. Council, what Ms. is Fia? your preference? Yes, Thanks. Ms. Malta. Thank you. Do we have a sense of how many buildings currently would, or is that just complete guesswork? 
Yeah, it's it's hard to it's hard to say with the the history of our of our billing categories um, before the multifamily category was put in place. Multifamily and commercial were charged the same amount, so there there wasn't any concern about making sure we identified those buildings that had those different categories because they were charged the same amount. So we know that there are a few in town, but I couldn't tell you exactly how many or which ones. Mr. Young. Mr. Walters. Yeah, that is a good point. This, this, this actually has been a problem for a number of years since we created the, the multifamily uh, rate um, and haven't been able to apply it cleanly to buildings that are mixed use, uh, where part of the building theoretically should get a commercial rate and the other part should get a multifamily rate, but we don't have a way of differentiating. So this has been an ongoing problem. Still need to figure it out. I think um, uh, the buildings that would qualify here would be the ones that would be automatically enrolled under the mechanics of the ordinance by the finance department. Mm -hmm. um, and in order to be qualifying, they would basically be the housing authority or the family center uh, buildings. So um, if we were to come up with an alternative to fix that, uh, assumedly the finance director could also automatically unenroll or make the adjustment, because uh, that's how it's contemplated here. So what I would suggest is um, we move to approve the ordinance as presented with the substitute language that's on the screen for 3.50.030D. Okay, so we have a motion by Mr. Walters to approve subsequent to how he just described it. Is there a second? Second. Uh, second by Ms. Hubick. Any further discussion? Mr. Young. Um, Mr. McDougall. Mr. Young. Yes, sir, Mr. McDougall. Please go forward. Hi. Just wanted to let you all know that I joined a few minutes ago. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McDougall. Mr. Francis, would you make note? Okay. So, Ms. I do one last thing. So, is this something that we could, how would we say? Mr. McDougall. No, I joined a few minutes ago. Uh, Mr. McDougall, if that is you, you, you you'd, it's an issue with us hearing you clearly. You sound like you're on a starship. <laughs> or an echo. Or, or an Sorry. echo. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Miss Moulton. Oh, thanks. So is there a way? Yeah, I'm in a bad, I'm in a bad location. Uh, Mr. McDougall, <laughs> what we could do is we'll let Miss Moulton go forward. And if, right after she gets through, if there's something you want to say, please um, just come forward and we'll move from that, okay? You still sound like you're on the enterprise. Ms. Moulton. <laughs> is, is there a way that we could, you know, stick a pin in this and come back and revisit it at a certain point? Or, I mean, I don't want, because this is a, a valid point, how, how do we ensure that we come back and look at this if we do get new soft billing software or something? So. Um, that point, the new we will have to at some point implement a new billing software. We know that there's an end date on this one we have, but it's currently four years out. So it's um, I guess I'm I'm not sure we can I, I'm I'm not sure how to make sure we circle back. We could I could put it on my calendar six months from now, a year from now. We can put it as a standing item on either hacks or finance committee, I can work with the staff to see if we can come up with, with different ideas. But um, it, I guess it depends on, on how important this, this item is to the, overall, to the overall ordinance, if you want to move forward with this or without it. But either, either way, we can continue discussing at the staff and committee level. OK, I'm OK with doing that, with moving it forward and just remembering to come back to it. Okay, and Mr. McDougall, are you in a better spot? Okay, um, at this point, is that a second, Ms. Moulton? Oh. Not really. Oh, there was already, 
and the Zoom mute button is apparently not working very well either. You, you better, you better try it, Mr. McDougall. All right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so we have a, a motion uh, by Mr. Walters, a second by um, Ms. Hubick. Um, Mr. Franciot, would you t take the call? Roll. Ms. Moulton. Yes. Mr. McDougall. Ms. Hubick. Yes. Mr. Carter. Yes. Mr. Walters. Yes. Mr. Young. Yes. Mr. McDougall. Mr. Young. Ms. Swetnam over here. Uh Miss Whitnum, I, I, you know, I was used to the Star Trek. I w wasn't sure if it was a call coming from above. <laughs> <laughs> you you flatter me. Uh, no, I was just going to make the recommendation that because Mr. McDougal joined this item late in the discussion and because of technical difficulties that we consider him to have abstained on the vote in the minutes. Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you. Next on our agenda, we have um, Ordinance 4045, Title IX Update Discussion and Possible Action, and Ms. Swetnam is on her way to the microphone. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Young and members of council. Uh, I'm, I'm up here with Chief Floyd. So what's before you tonight and in the packet is Ordinance 4045, which is a rewrite of the city's Title IX. Uh, tonight is just a first read, so we're not asking council to take any action tonight. Uh, there's still a number of edits that were being made as recently as today, so there's still some work that's going into this. Uh, but I'm going to introduce the ordinance and provide a little background. So the background is Title IX is the city's title that's currently entitled, uh, I just said title a lot, Public Peace, Morals, and Welfare. And that is the, the portion of the code that regulates criminal activities. Uh, I want to point out that there are other chapters and sections in the municipal code that create criminal infractions um, and misdemeanors, for example, Titles 6, 12, 13, 19. Uh, but this is primarily where most of the crimes that get charged under the municipal code uh, come from. I went back and looked at the existing Title IX, and there hasn't been a comprehensive rewrite of this title since 1986. Um, there have been some periodic updates uh, as recently as 2022, but uh, this ordinance will, re will update and replace the entire title and it will be updated to say to uh, be public peace, safety, and welfare. So there's a, a couple of reasons uh, that led to the need to rewrite this title. Uh, one of the first ones is to address court penalties. Uh, so we, we wanted to incorporate state crimes by reference into our code. Uh, there's a section in the RCW 350-100 that says that fees imposed by a municipal court for violations of municipal ordinances are deposited into the city's general fund. So we had a number of uh, state crimes that the city code did not incorporate by reference. So if there were, were penalties that were issued pursuant to violations of those sections, the city did not collect any portion of those fees or penalties. So now by incorporating those state RCW violations into our municipal code, the city will then be able to, to collect a portion of those penalties. So uh, that just seems to make sense and it's consistent with what other jurisdictions do and, and that's common practice. 
Uh, we also kind of separately an issue came up with the city's bail schedule and the need to clarify that the fines that are identified in our code do not include additional assessments. So if somebody gets a $250 penalty, the, the reality is that they're paying something closer to $512 or something like that um, when all of the state assessments and penalties get factored in. So it, it seemed important to clarify that point in this title as well. Uh, an, a, another additional equally important issue is uh, the, the need to update our code in the aftermath of the Blake decision and some of the uh, legislative uh, provisions that have been enacted since then. So State versus Blake, as we know, invalidated the state law which made possession of a controlled substance a strict liability offense, meaning that there was no uh, knowledge requirement. Uh, in response to that, the Washington State Legislature adopted RCW 1031-115, which prohibits law enforcement from arresting someone for unlawful possession of a controlled substance until the offender has been twice diverted to voluntary social services. Um, that's a lot of, of um, you know, context to say that the city has uh, a limited opportunity now to enforce uh, drug offenses in the same way that it that it did before, and so uh, there, we've seen other jurisdictions adopt ordinances that prohibit uh, the use of controlled substances on public property, and so that's built into this ordinance as well. So the ordinance itself, um, this is the structure. I won't read it all to you, but these are the titles of the chapters, and they largely mirror what's in existing Title IX with um, some, some tweaks to allow us to incorporate by reference those state offenses. So uh, there's a number of noteworthy provisions. Um, the, the, the first one is that there are multiple criminal er, violations that are adopted by reference from the Revised Code of Washington. Um, I wanted to flag the language in the general chapter 902030D that says, unless otherwise provided, any penalties identified in this chapter do not include fees, costs, and assessments. So that makes it clear for our court what amounts they need to put into the bail schedule, and it makes it clear for people who are uh, charged with these, that, with these offenses that the penalties will have those additional um, assessments added onto them. Uh, so the kind of the new sections related to controlled substances and paraphernalia, um, section 922030 um, makes it a gross misdemeanor to use controlled substances in public places, which includes public property like streets and public facilities, parks, but also places where the public, uh, that are open to the public like establishments and parking lots. Um, and, and related, 922040 makes it a misdemeanor to deposit drugs or paraphernalia on the ground or in bodies of water. Um, we, we've borrowed, as we do in, in the public sector, um, some, some of the language and guidance in crafting these provisions from other jurisdictions that have similar ordinances that have been successfully implemented. So one other item that I, I raise as a policy question, and this, uh, this uh, Chief Floyd and I have talked about this a fair bit, is a change that was proposed to the, the title related to trespass on city property. Um, so that ordinance, if you all recall, was, was recently adopted that provided a, a clear process and, and due process um, protections for people who engaged in conduct that, uh, that met certain criteria that would lead to an exclusion from city property under the penalty of, of a trespass violation. Um, the way that the ordinance was adopted, it said that anyone who has been excluded from city property and violates that, uh, that exclusion would, th that they're excluded from that property for, for a period of one year. So the proposed change in the title would create kind of a sliding scale um, based on the number of issues that had come up with that individual in the previous calendar year. 
Um, so I think the proposed language says that if there were no violations in the prior year, it could be up to a seven day exclusion from, from that public property. If there was one violation in the previous year, it could be up to a 90 day exclusion. If there were two or more violations in the previous year, then it could be up to a one year exclusion. Um, and talking with Chief Floyd, the, the police are recommending that the exclusions could be up to a w one year um, so that when they're issuing these trespass warnings, they don't have to go back and look at, at files on the individuals involved to determine how many previous trespass issues had come up. Um, and, and there's also an appeal process to allow for somebody to ask for a reduced exclusion period based on circumstances that come up. So I, I, I bring that up um, just to flag that as a, as a policy issue that council may want to think about. Um, Chief Floyd may have something that he wants to add. Uh, but those are my comments on the ordinance. I'm happy to answer questions. Chief Floyd is here as well to answer questions. Thank you, Ms. Wetnam. Council, any questions, comments? Mr. Walters. Mr. Young, thank you. Uh, so I would say, first of all, this is one of a series of steps we're proposing to improve public safety, more effectively deal with problems affecting public order. Um, what's very important to me is that we are not wringing our hands about the legislature, but that we are charting our own path here uh, and, and then navigating the path that is allowable to take. Um, so the big way that we are doing that is through the adoption of this new crime of um, use of drugs in public. Uh, which is not a crime under state law, didn't need to be a crime under state law in the past because we had the crime of simple possession. Um, but now because that's more difficult to enforce, let's give APD a new tool um, to more effectively deal with a situation where they come upon people who are actively using illegal drugs right in front of them. Uh, and under current state law, they, they can't take action other than make a referral to drug treatment. Um, now, I think referrals to drug treatment are great, but they don't work uh, by themselves, and we have research on that. So um, the legislature is probably going to remove that provision. Um, there's a bill in the state uh, house now that's already been passed from the Senate uh, that would eliminate the referral requirement. It would still encourage it, but wouldn't uh, require it anymore um, and it would make drug possession a gross misdemeanor rather than a misdemeanor which it is today um, but also we don't know if that will pass uh, and what we do know is that we can do this today and well not today because it's our first read but we can do this now and um, we can make that a crime because the legislature hasn't acted in that sphere so uh, that's why we propose this here I think it's also important for us to clarify that we expect um, uh, the city prosecutor to allow offenses that are born of poverty and drug addiction to move forward through our therapeutic courts, which here is our community court. And that won't always be an appropriate remedy for people, but where it is, um, they should have the opportunity because you can throw people in jail and it's very expensive for us, and we don't have a great track record as a nation of yielding success out of that. If we can get people into treatment and get people up out of drugs, that's the best possible solution. So if therapeutic courts have the ability to do that, that's the way we should go. Um, I heard uh, one city attorney recently say that therapeutic courts need to be the standard rather than the exception, uh, but there will need to be times when it's not appropriate. So I think what I would propose is that we add a line um, in the general provisions to Title IX saying that the prosecutor is encouraged to utilize therapeutic courts or other alternatives to prosecution. Um, so only an encouragement, not a requirement, but is required to file a reason with the court uh, for any objection to the use of a therapeutic court. because. The prosecutor is authorized by statute to object to use of a therapeutic court, ha has effectively a veto. Um, but the court would prefer that uh, the prosecutor file a reason, and I think we deserve that as well, um, so that we know why uh, a therapeutic court might not be used. 
and then we can promote the use of the therapeutic court, of community court, as it is called here, uh, in Anacortes and in Skagit County, and make certain that it is yielding the results that we want. Because the alternative, sending people to jail, you know, it's expensive, there's frequently no room at the inn, uh, it's, it's not a, a functional uh, approach either. Um, because this is a complete rewrite, it's not shown in strike through and underline, but we have tried to put explanatory text in blue highlight as to where sections came from and how they're being changed. There's certainly other laws that aren't incorporated here, other state laws that aren't incorporated by reference. There are state laws that don't exist yet that we might want to incorporate by reference in the future. But this creates a framework so that there's a place to put them. And so if we want to add them in the future, it's relatively easy to insert them in there. I think we've built that, that framework and you'll see a, you know, a standard structure for how to create the criminal offense in one of the, in one of the blue highlights as well. Um, overall, I think that this is a useful tool uh, to move us forward. It's, it's also something that we ought to expect um, APD to enforce. We, we have to get control of the drug problem in Anacortes and nationally and regionally. I mean, it's exploded because of fentanyl and, and all of these other things, uh, but we cannot tie our hands and we cannot sit on our hands uh, because the legislature has not acted as quickly as we might like. We need to go after this with all the tools that we have. So um, this is our first read. We're not taking action tonight, but I would really hope we take action in a week, two weeks, you know, whatever the changes are that we need, that we make them, and then we get this going. Thank you, Mr. Walters. I, you know, I just wanted to add, short of the other council members, and before we open it up for uh, discussion, you know, this is a hard problem. I think if the solutions was just so readily available that we could adopt it, I know that our hearts are in the right place to just adopt those solutions that we know will work. Right now, you know, it's, it's a huge problem. You know, people are dying, families are affected. It's just not uh, the one person who's either addicted or suffering in one way or another that's affected. It's all of the family members. You know, we had mental illness in my family, you know, my extended family. But it was a difficult journey for us. You know, what did we know what to do? You know, the services that were needed to help, you know, weren't there or the labyrinth was so difficult. It, when you're in crisis, you don't have a month or two or three to try to figure out how do you get someone into those systems. And so it, it is a difficult thing. But also we recognize that the impact is not just on those families. It is also on the community with which we live. And that we have to find a way to strike that balance between not only compassion, services, help, but also enforcement of the rules of law as best as we can put them forward and to try to be as compassionate as possible, but at the same time enforce the law and try to find help as best as we can. So it is a delicate two-step. It really is. And um, I think that this attempt in this discussion is one to thread the needle. And if you have ideas and solutions on how we can best do this such that we meet those needs of community and also those that are in need of our help, come forward. I mean, because council, the committees, the police, the staff, everybody's truly listening, trying to figure out how do we do this. But no one has an absolute solution. No one. So if we can come as close as we can, and it's a fluid process, quite honestly, it's not one time and it's done. The needs of our communities are constantly changing. The things we need to address are new things that may not have been present years ago. But it's just what we do and what we have to do. Um, at this point, I'm going to any other council members because I'm going to open it up to discussion. OK, at this point, I'm going to open this up to anyone that have any comment. Or chief, if whenever you want to jump in, just leap up. Um, you know the protocol by now, sir. Uh, Dan Mall, 7-Eleven commercial. So it was my understanding, and, and I am by no means an expert on any of this, but the Blake decision 
essentially prohibited us or anybody from making these kinds of changes and, and we haven't done this for a number of years. So what has changed to prevent uh, the lawsuits that were essentially being threatened uh, as a result of the Blake decision if we were to start arresting people and making them accountable for this? I, yeah. Sure. So the, is that working? Okay, it is. Yeah, the answer to that question is that those citations were being issued pursuant to state law, and the Blake decision made that particular provision of state law unconstitutional. Um, it didn't prohibit local jurisdictions from adopting ordinances that created their own violations, and that's what we're doing here. So somebody would be cited under this new ordinance pursuant to the new section of the Anacortes Municipal Code, not for a violation of state law drug charges. So it's a good question. Mr. Young. Mr. Walters. And to follow up a little bit there, so the, the state law prohibits us from changing the crime of simple drug possession. Uh, but it doesn't prohibit us from creating the new crime of use of drugs in public. So we are threading the needle. Uh, we are finding the way. Uh, and uh, thank you for the community members who suggested this, because other jurisdictions have done this too. Um, it, it's, it's the way to navigate that and, and make it functional for us. Chief. Well, Mr. Walters answered part of the question before I got to it. Uh, as he stated, the uh, Blake decision affected uh, simple possession by individuals. Uh, this provision would be addressing uh, public drug use. So those are two different things. Uh, also, I appreciate uh, consideration by our legal department and counsel in addressing not only the public drug use, but the unlawful deposit of drug paraphernalia. As we know, there's been multiple complaints regarding uh, needles and other drug paraphernalia that have been left in parks, on city streets, uh, beaches, and shoreline. And while it all could be classified as litter, I see that uh, those, in, those items being a much uh, more heightened risk to our community members than the average fast food wrapper. And I think it warrants addressing that with the appropriate level of um, criminal penalty. Thank you, Chief. I wanted to uh, just make sure that our online council members, if you have anything you want to add, you're welcome to just jump in at any point. If not, um, we'll just move forward and further open it up to the public. Anyone else with comment? Mr. Young? Uh, Ms. Walton. Seeing no hands raised or anyone coming up to the podium, um, I have a question about the being in public. So if I am sitting in a car on a public street and my friends hop in and we all, we do drugs and the police see us, is that, does that count as being, doing drugs in a public place? My interpretation of this uh, proposed ordinance would be yes. Uh, that is uh, a vehicle on a public roadway and within public view. So you would be subject to this ordinance. Okay, and then this doesn't apply as that I can see to cannabis or does it? Uh, no, this does not apply to cannabis specifically. Okay, so that is not. If someone's smoking weed in a car on the street. That is addressed separately uh, under the RCW. That is a, an infraction that's issuable, a pre existing statute. Okay, so that's a citation rather than a misdemeanor. Or criminal infraction. Uh, a criminal citation would be uh, a misdemeanor or a gross misdemeanor. An infraction would be a civil penalty similar to a speeding like a ticket. ticket. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. One question, um, Chief. And it's really, just to make sure, this also begins to address, um, when it says paraphernalia, it, could, it also begins to address the, illegi, the illegalness of paraphernalia being on the ground. Like we were, um, there are various venues in the city that, whether it's the port or whether it's the bathroom or whether it's, you know, wherever it is, that 
we're finding more and more paraphernalia, drug paraphernalia, that also makes that illegal. Is that not correct? Yeah, so if, if there is a way to show who is responsible for uh, depositing that uh, somewhere other than the intended uh, safe receptacles, mm -hmm. then that would be the chargeable offense. And it's to minimize the risk uh, to community members by leaving that uh, just in inappropriate places. Thank you. I saw Mr. Walters' hand moving. Uh, is there anything else, Mr. Walters? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I saw you moving near the microphone a couple of times, so I wanted to give you the opportunity to have you say. Um, I, I imagine that the second uh, new crime that we're adding, the drug paraphernalia uh, one, will be have, have a harder evidentiary uh, problem because if it's just laying there on the ground, how do you know where it came from? But exactly. uh, still, it's still setting an expectation for the community, um, and so I think it's still valuable. Um, just anticipating some other reaction from other members of our community. Uh, illegal drug use is not a victimless crime. I mean, it had, drug addiction and the drug use takes a serious toll on the user, on their families, on our community. Um, I, I really don't want to hear that from somebody, you know, that uh, drug use is a victimless crime. I anticipate hearing it, but it's not true. Um, we, we need to do whatever it is we can uh, to eliminate drug use in our community, to eliminate drug dealing in our community, but also uh, deal with drug addiction um, through, through the ways that we've articulated here to treat it and get people off of drugs. There are certainly lots of people today that have problems with drug addiction as a result of opioid use you know, that is very different from how people uh, ended up as drug addicts in the past. Um, we, we don't need to, we don't need to talk in terms of any moral superiority over people that are addicted to drugs. What we need to do is get them off of it. So if this is a tool that works, this is what we need. Thank you. Ms. Moulton. Mr. Young, um, I agree. I think this really starts moving us in the direction that we want to go. And it is going to take enforcement, and it's going to be hard, but this is, this is where we need to go, so I'm in favor. And I, I think, you know, it does its first read. We need some tweaks on it, but as a community, this is going to be of benefit to all of us. Thank you, Ms. Moulton. Chief, is there anything else? Uh, just, uh, we've got a hand up and back, and if you want to come forward to the microphone and state your name and that you... And um, where you live. Hi, Mark McKeithrin, uh, Anna Cortis. My question is, I know there's been a, first of all, I totally think we should move forward on this, I, that you should move forward on this. Uh, there's been talk about getting cameras on our streets. Would this be enforceable through just observation through cameras or even our own personal ring cameras? So just questioning whether uh, does it have to be eyewitnessed, or could cameras also enforce this law? I think what Mr. McKeithrin was referring to is the misdemeanor presence rule, which I don't believe uh, this ordinance would meet that standard. So uh, there are certain crimes in the misdemeanor presence rule that uh, an officer can take action even if they weren't witnessing that firsthand. And I don't believe this would be one of those. Mr. Walters. Um, but Chief, if you have surveillance camera footage, it by itself may not meet that s the evidentiary standard that you need. But it can assumedly let you know that this is occurring at this location. You can then follow it up with other police activity to get the evidence you need, right? That is potentially correct, yes. Uh, care to expand on that in any? In any way or does yeah it, it would it would allow uh, some targeted enforcement to the individuals uh, like you're referencing so if if we, it would um, help address knowing uh, individuals particularly responsible uh, specific times of day when this is a more frequent problem anything like that that would allow the targeted enforcement to um, be 
when and where that's occurring and have a, a greater likelihood of an officer present to observe those things. And I think, you know, maybe another way to synopsize this is that, as been mentioned here tonight, there is no silver bullet. Uh, you know, we need all the tools that we can to figure out how to address it. Thank you, Chief. I think there's a hand up in the back, a finger up, right. <laughs> Beth Bell, Anna Cordes. Um, clarifying question. So, when all of this hubbub started, call 911, call the police station if you see anything. You come out. By that time, the activity's gone. How does a ring or another device not allow you to enforce these ordinances? That doesn't make sense. You ask us to call, but by the time you get there, you're not seeing it. But now we have photographic devices that are capturing those moments. They should be able to uphold the law or the ordinance. Mr. Young. Mr. Welters. In the criminal justice system, the people are represented by two separate yet equally important groups. Uh, <clears throat> and then there's the public defenders and the defense attorneys. And so if you've got video footage that shows a little bag of white powder, they're going to say that that wasn't drugs. And you do need to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. And having presented to juries, I can tell you that juries take their jobs very seriously. Um, and they are inclined to give defendants reasonable doubt. So you could take the footage and you could try to make a case, uh, but you may also very well fail. Um, if we're talking about uh, drug deals you see on the street, or if we're talking about drug houses, yes, calling 911 is valuable because police are aware of it, they can log it, it's not by itself in any way sufficient. You know, we need more police activity, we need more police officers available uh, to be able to go after those um, houses and we need a whole of government response to do the enforcement that is necessary to eliminate drug houses in our community. As I say, no silver bullet. This is one tool. And it's, it's pretty objectionable to me that today, if police run into somebody outside the door to City Hall who's smoking some illegal drug in public, they can't arrest them and charge them immediately right now. But they could under this. So, you know, it'll go after some facets of the problem, but we're going to have to do more work on the other facets of the problem. Thank you for all the comments. I don't see any other hands. Uh, Ms. Swetnam. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to, I just wanted to kind of close by saying, um, you know, we've got a little bit more work to do on this ordinance. Um, my hope is to bring it back to council, not next Monday, but the Monday after, to allow for a time to receive those comments and incorporate them into an updated draft. So if members of the public or members of council have feedback or comments, please direct those to Chief Floyd and myself, and we'll, um, we'll work on getting an updated draft back to council. Thank you, Ms. Swetnam. Thank you. I think we had some good feedback. Without, with that, we're going to, is it okay that we move to the next item on the agenda? Uh, the next item on the agenda is item 6D, Ordinance 4046, an interim ordinance declaring an emergency and adopting a moratorium on the acceptance of certain land use, building permit, and business license application in the commercial central business district marine mixed use and commercial marine use zones regarding short-term rentals in residential um, dwelling units. It's a discussion and possible action item. Mr. Miesemer, thank you very much, sir. Mayor Pro Tem, <laughs> members of the council and the audience. The proposed ordinance 4046 uh, is a moratorium on establishing new short-term rentals, which are considered uh, overnight lodging for less than 30 days in residential dwelling units in the commercial central business district, marine mixed use, and commercial marine use zones. And the moratorium will allow time for city staff, the planning commission, the city council, 
to review options and determine impacts on our current housing unit supply, what those impacts might be to neighbors and on affordable housing units. So essentially, I, I think you all realize that a, a short-term rental does take those rental units off the long-term rental market, therefore less units available to those folks that are living here in Anacortes. Um, so this would not, this moratorium would not affect short-term rentals currently licensed and would not, uh, those would not be impacted and overnight lodging such as hotels and motels would also not be impacted by this moratorium. So city staff would return to the council uh, within 60 days for a public hearing along with a work plan to lay out the path floor, forward on, on the, you know, what will need to be done. Um, we did receive one comment letter from Evergreen Islands in support of the moratorium, and that was distributed to the council today earlier by email. That's all I have. If you have any questions, be happy to answer those. Um, it is open for public comment, but it is not a public hearing. All right, um, Mr. Walters. Thank you, Mr. Young. The Council Planning Committee has uh, drafted and recommended this ordinance because housing is such a crisis in our community, but also the, the prospect of enabling new housing, including in these zones, which are the commercial zones, uh, only to see them turned into short-term rentals. You know, having people uh, who feel very deeply about height and those types of of density issues and then us not achieve our housing goal um, or uh, get less close to achieving our housing goal because those units get turned into short-term rentals would be really contrary to everything that we're trying to do. Plus, a residential unit pays a residential impact fee um, and connection fee and if they're actually a short-term rental, they should be paying full up uh, retail price on our impact fees and our commercial fees, not getting the break as, as a residential unit. Um, I do remember, it was, you know, it was a number of years ago now, uh, Wally Funk uh, saying that his big concern about uh, new development on our waterfront, and I think specifically he was talking about MJB, was all, all this new residential development gets built and it is then not inhabited by people, but <laughs> rather by tourists. Uh, it becomes not a community, but just, you know, an empty tower that during the summer months is, is uh, inhabited by people who don't care about the community, uh, who aren't invested in the community, maybe more accurately, uh, and, are, and are just visiting. That, that's, there's a place for hotels and motels, and we could probably use more of those, but residential uh, development needs to be used for long-term residents to add to our housing stock. So uh, this is a hole in our current code uh, that would be plugged uh, by this moratorium. Thank you, Mr. Walters. Ms. Moulton. Thank you. Uh, I agree with Mr. Walters. And then also when you started to say not inhabited, there's also the potential of these units being purchased and not inhabited at all, which is, an, which is a related but um, separate issue for people who have their second and third and fourth homes here, so I don't know if there's something that we can do about that, but that we can talk about that at a committee meeting. But that's a concern as well to me. But I, I'm in favor of this ordinance for sure. Um, you know, my personal opinion is that, you know, we've had, you know, there's a huge need for housing. Yes, it is. Uh, we have our city um, as much as we don't like to use the d word and associate in association with our city but we are discovered <laughs> you know by nature of all of the buildings and everything else and and you know this is something that we just have to look at and try to figure out again how do we um, maximize the opportunity we have for housing but also at the same time not constrain and strangle uh, the desires of other people to come here and visit. And so I think that that, again, is um, my word for the night is delicate balance and threading the needle. I think this is a huge effort by uh, the committees to uh, find a solution. So again, your opinions really do matter. 
and uh, your thoughts and solutions um, are important to be brought to the table. Sometimes, you know, as a society, we can bring problems forward, but some of us that are bringing the problems forward to, to, for analysis also have great ideas. You know, things that move us closer, so why not? So, um, again, thank you. Mr. 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 Staff does recommend approval of Ordinance 4046 this evening. And as I mentioned, um, city staff will be coming back for a public hearing within 60 days. So. Ms. Moulton. Um, great, thank you. I move to approve ordinance 4046 as presented. Second. We have a motion by um, Ms. Moulton and a second by Ms. Hubick. Any further discussion? Uh, there's a, a hand in back, Mr. Welcher. Yes, please. And I appreciate it, Mr. Welcher. You did sign up for this, and it was so far down the list that I sort of almost forgot you. But you know, I'm glad you spoke up. Thank you, Brian Welcher, Forest Park Lane. I'd like to speak to you tonight on behalf of Evergreen Islands. Um, this has been an issue that uh, we've been involved with for some time. On March 31st of 2020, Evergreen Islands submitted an Anacor's Comprehensive Plan Amendment to include a poli uh, policies that protect residential neighborhoods and support low-income housing by regulating short-term vacation rentals to mitigate their negative impacts. Uh, accordingly, because we believe the ordinance in front of you accomplishes these goals, at least on an interim basis. We wholeheartedly support this and the city council's efforts to deal with this increasingly difficult issue, uh, which many other communities around the Sound have found it necessary to deal with. Um, uh, as Mr. Miesmer spoke, uh, um, uh, spoke of, um, Tom Glade, our current president of Evergreen Islands, has supplied you with a uh, letter uh, with more detailed comments uh, uh, for us on the, uh, and we thank our, our uh, planner emeritus for providing that with you in such a timely way. Uh, we th believe you're going in the right direction and we hope that we can solve this in a way that supports both affordable housing and the community values that we all value in this, that we, find, that we love in this community. And lastly, um, just on a personal note, I would like to thank Mr. Miesmer for his many decades of uh, polite and dedicated public service to the city of Anacortes. I always knew when I came to staff um, that Mr. Miesmer would be honest and straightforward. We've agreed to disagree many times, but I think the best measure of a public servant is that they left the place better than they found it. And I think that can generously be said about Mr. Miesmer. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Welcher. And thank you for those comments about Mr. Uh, Miesmer. And we acknowledge, well, first of all, we acknowledge Evergreen Island's letter. Uh, it did come to my inbox. I had a chance to read it from Mr. Glade. Um, you know, when, as you were talking about Mr. Miesemer, a little um, tongue in cheek, uh, Mr. Miesemer. You ever seen those big basketball um, sneakers that they put out for those basketball players that are dick this big and huge, almost like it's uh, a distance of six feet? And they've got huge, huge feet. So as we're looking for someone to try to fill the shoes of Mr. Miesemer, I'm telling you, it, those are huge shoes to fill. And we thank you for um, just everything that you tried to do. Sometimes it wasn't as successfully received as maybe it should have been or could have been. But, you know, in a, a career as long as yours, you've had both the whip and the, and the carrot. And I thank you for standing as long as you have for as hard as you have. I think much of where we are as a city is attributable to, uh, uh, to the many, but also to a department 
that tried its best to do the right thing for the public. And one of the reasons that this city, in my opinion, is in the shape that it is compared to many others is because of some of the work that you've done. So personally, thank you. Anything you want to add, Mr. Miesmer? We could pass the ordinance. Okay. Oh, okay, good. No. Thank you, Mr. Miesmer, for that. Uh, we have uh, a motion by Ms. Um, Moulton and a second by Ms. Hubick. And <laughs> Mr. Francis, would you take the vote, please? Mr. McDougall. Ms. Hubick. Yes. Mr. Carter. Yes. Mr. Walters. Yes. Mr. Young. Yes. Ms. Moulton. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, short of anything else, for the good of the order, uh, I think this um, culminates my turn as Mayor Pro Tem for today. Thank you very much, and we adjourn this meeting.